thank you all for your attention over these last 10 minutes. I promise I am the last person um, speaking uh, before you guys get to get back to networking uh, with those at your table. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing uh, to try to flip the previous model for biomedical research on its head. And I want to start by giving you my motivation for why uh, we've decided to do this. So I didn't recognize the real need for disruption in the biomedical research space, despite lots of school, medical school, public health degree, all that stuff, um, until I was actually a patient. So this photo here is from August of 2010, when I went from being a third year medical student at UPenn, treating patients, dedicating my life to cancer research, to where I was hospitalized at UPenn just down the street for seven weeks in their intensive care unit. Uh, I ended up spending a total of four and a half months over a six month period hospitalized, had my last rites read to me, uh, survived, uh, got a lot of chemotherapy, uh, and eventually walked out of that hospital. But it was that experience as a patient and, and, and nearly dying that made me realize just how much innovation needs to occur in the biomedical research space. So in the next eight minutes or so, I'm gonna highlight some of the hurdles uh, for Casimo disease research that are also wi in, uh, wider hurdles, um, some of the, the progress that we've made for Casimo disease, and how I think that this is a model that other rare diseases can look to. So this is a photo of my dad and I um, back in 2010, as I mentioned during that six month period of being in the hospital. Um, here's another, another photo with him. But as I said, over that six month period, I had my last rites read to me, and, and actually um, that experience, um, having my last rites read to me, occurred when I was incredibly ill, and we tried one therapy for the disease that we finally diagnosed, idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, a disease where the immune system becomes activated, releases chemicals called cytokines, and those cytokines shut down organs, liver, kidneys, and bone marrow. So I had just gotten the diagnosis, and I got the one drug that my doctor had used before on patients with idiopathic MCD. Unfortunately, the drug didn't work right away. So unfortunately, this doctor didn't have experience with other drugs, so he decided to wait and see. But in the meantime, he didn't think I was gonna survive, so he encouraged my family to call in my priest. Now, later on in my talk, I'll talk to you about just why we need to generate data behind all of the drugs, approved or unapproved, that can solve and treat rare diseases. I, I called that first slide overtime number one, and that's because I consider myself an overtime ever since I had my last rites read to me and, and I survived. Um, but unfortunately, slide, this next slide is overtime number two. And that's because even though I walked that, out of that hospital I was, and I was healthy for 15 months, I was able to finish medical school at Penn, Unfortunately, idiopathic multicentric calcium disease came back, and all the treatments, all the maintenance I was on were ineffective. So I had overtime number two, and this is uh, me ready for war. Um, I'm actually getting uh, seven different chemotherapy agents at the time, and, and I'm ready to take this disease on. I'm, I was positive at the time. And then this is a photo from four weeks later, after this disease just beat my tail one more time. Uh, and this is, this is the point uh, where I, I made the change and I, and I realized that I couldn't rely on the existing medical system and the progress that was in place. That if I wanted to survive and I wanted to overcome this disease that kills most patients by five years, I needed to get involved in driving forward science. And, and so uh, in order for me to give a background on, on what we've done for Castleman, or actually, let me start, I'm gonna start with Castleman disease. Um, within the wider frame of the biomedical research space. So back in 2012, um, uh, you saw the, the pictures. I started looking at what's going on currently uh, in the biomedical research space for Castleman's. First place I went to was up to date. Many of you guys probably have used it for uh, uh, learning about what are the right treatments for, for diseases. So I went to up to date and it said that there were four cases ever of idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease and that one was alive. Unfortunately, up to date was not up to date because since then I've, I've done work and found that actually there have been over 600 reported cases and as you know, very, uh, a very small percentage of, of actual cases ever get reported. Secondly, there was no communication going on between researchers 
and all the researchers were using different terminology systems. There was no understanding for what was triggering this intense immune response, what was the problem cell, what was going on within the cell, or what treatments would be effective. There was no consensus on a diagnostic criteria, no patient advocacy effort, and the disease model that we used didn't make any sense. So within, or sorry, the, the wider biomedical space, um, there are some additional problems, and many of you guys will recognize this diagram of the, the pipeline for drug development. And this, the first three arrows, the green arrows, are usually before MBAs get involved. Usually the MBAs uh, start getting involved around preclinical to drug development and commercialization. Um, but it's that, that box beforehand where we do all the discovery to understand what should we target. And so I'm going to give a, a kind of an oversimplified uh, description for what goes on in that black box. Traditionally, it involves patient advocacy groups raising as much money as they possibly can amongst patients and loved ones, and then inviting researchers to apply through RFPs for specific projects. So there's specific projects that that researcher believes need to be done. So each researcher applies for the funding, and that's how biomedical research usually moves forward in that, in that black box. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, there's some real issues um, with that system. One, it's not a part of an overarching strategy. Those researchers aren't applying for funding that's the most important thing to move the needle. They're applying for funding for things that they're good at and that they think that they can do well to get additional funding for. Second, this, this model doesn't promote collaboration. Third, there are no tools for them to communicate if they did want to collaborate. And there's, mis there's a significant misalignment of incentives. So at this point, I'm sitting in 2012, um, having almost died multiple times, battling a disease with a terrible life expectancy, and I decided there really were two paths forward. So one was to conduct research at Penn uh, in my last year of medical school to try to better understand what is the current state of knowledge for this disease and what do we need to do to move things forward. But in parallel, it couldn't just be something done at Penn. It had to be a global effort, and I had to create something that could bring players together from around the world to solve this disease. So um, very briefly, I'm gonna try not to get too technical with this, but this is, this is the thing that gets me like, the most excited is looking at the model of pathogenesis. Um, but uh, I apologize. Um, so uh, this is the old model of pathogenesis. For Casome disease, I mentioned this intense immune response. The old model, was at the, top of the, at the top of the diagram, you see this, what we used to call Castleman disease lymph nodes, Castleman tumors. These tumors were believed to release chemicals called cytokines. Cytokines are inflammatory chemicals. Your immune system, all of our immune systems release that trigger other cells to release more chemicals and to get activated. Those chemicals cause multiple organ failure. That, that's the old model. Tumor releases chemicals, causes organ failure. Unfortunately, this model just didn't make sense when we put all the papers together. So the new model that we published, as you can tell, first off, much more complicated. Um, but the, the real takeaway from this new model is that what we used to think was the cause and that what was driving the disease, these lymph node changes, are actually an effect. They're a result of the cytokines. So when we think about Castleman disease, it's not a tumor that releases chemicals. It's a hyperactivated immune system that releases chemicals which changes the lymph nodes, but also shuts down organs. And the reason that's extremely important is because before, when we thought they were lymph node tumors, we had to use cytotoxic chemotherapy to kill the tumors. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, cytotoxic chemotherapy is not fun, and if you can avoid cytotoxic chemotherapy, you should. So with this new approach, <laughs> it's not a great way to get a buzz. There's other ways to get haircuts. So, so instead of cytotoxic chemotherapy, we're now trying immunosuppressive uh, treatment to interrupt the immune system before the immune system can become activated. And the, the jury's still out, and we're very hopeful this new approach will work. So um, I briefly, I'm going to go through the, how we got to where we are from a, a global network perspective. And as I said, the old model for biomedical research, raise a lot of money, let researchers come one off to take the money and to spend it how they see fit. We said we want to take a completely different approach from that. We're going to start out, and this, this is, I said on this, as I said, about three years ago, we're going to start out by identifying all the physicians and researchers worldwide conducting work. We're going to connect them through annual meetings and also a simple discussion board. So first, unite the community. Second, use the community to prioritize what research should be done, 
What are the key things to actually move the needle? Not what are the things that you can do in your lab, but what are the things that we have to do as a field? So build the community, prioritize research, and then find the right people around the world to do each of those studies that are on your top 20 list. In parallel, assemble an incredible expert team, including people like Grant Mitchell, who spoke earlier, who's a part of our research team and our leadership team, and others in this room. Um, built, and through building this community, groups like pharmaceutical companies and academic partners want to come to us and work with us. So you, if you build a community, folks will want to partner with you. A couple of things I'm going to highlight. So we put together a scientific advisory board, represents eight different countries. We've held the three largest ever Castleman disease meetings, database of other 200 docs. We've got over 1,000 patients visiting our, our website, not just four. Um, we've established the current state of knowledge in blood, um, the journal Blood. Uh, we've assembled this international research agenda. Uh, we're doing outreach to researchers. This uh, past August, we secured a $4.5 million partnership to create a large global patient registry of Castleman disease. Uh, we're currently in the process of raising funds to execute our international research agenda, and we're distributing funds. Um, so th I'm going to go through this slide very quickly, but again, this is the slide that gets me most excited. Um, at the heart of Castleman disease, as I said, is this hyperactivated immune system uh, releasing chemicals called cytokines. Those chemicals cause downstream organs to, to fail, liver, kidney, bone marrow failure. So when we think about solving this disease, we have to figure out what is driving that intense immune response. And so we have three hypotheses for how it's driven. What I'm gonna show you on this slide is how we're trying, to we're trying to attack every aspect of our model so we can solve this disease. So the first is we need to quantify and characterize what are those chemicals in the blood? So we've just launched a study uh, with Symbiologics to measure over 1,200 serum proteins. Next, is there, what's triggering this? Is there a virus? Is there a bacteria? Is there something that could be triggering this immune response? So we're getting ready to launch a study with a guy named Ian Lipkin, who's the world's expert at this at Columbia University. Um, there's a researcher uh, here at the University of Pennsylvania that's trying to identify what is the cell that's gone wrong in Castleman disease. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but we're working with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard on sequencing. We're working with the University of Washington to look for small populations of malignant cells. We're working with folks at the NIH, Cincinnati Children's Medical Center, another study with another group at the NIH, and then our research team's also conducting the analysis. So this is to show you that the new model isn't to raise money and let researchers come to you with their ideas. The new model is to build a community, let the community prioritize how we're going to move the needle, and then find the right person around the world and the right people, as I shared, to take a disease down. So um, in parallel to doing all this research and to building this community, a lot of patients have come to us and, and asked for information, support, engagement through our website. And, uh, and of course, we've wanted to provide that. Um, and so uh, this first picture is a castle man. So I mentioned I have castle man disease. Uh, and this is, the, the, this is the image that comes up on Google image. This is a castle man. Um, but I decided that this castle man was way too puny um, for the, the castle man that's beaten my tail now, now five times. So this is more like the, the real castle man that I've gone to war with. Uh, this guy, I, although I think the real cast man probably needs like a machine gun, maybe a flamethrower or something. But this is, a, this is not a good guy. Um, so we put, on a, uh, we put together a patient forum about a year ago, and um, during a webinar, I, I threw up these two pictures. Um, and two weeks later on our Facebook page, I was pretty surprised when we saw this picture. This is one of our patients who got it tattooed on his shoulder. So this is like our first uh, Castleman warrior. And I think uh, if this is not patient engagement, I really, I really don't know what is patient <laughs> engagement. This guy got a tattoo on his shoulder. Um, but you know, I think that um, the moral of the story, and what I really want to share with all of you, um, is that these challenges that we're facing with Castleman disease and that we're overcoming and that I believe we will overcome um, are issues that, that we face for many rare diseases and, and even more common diseases. I don't need to go through these numbers. Jonathan did a great job before. But these are hurdles that 7,000 other diseases face. Uh, only 95% of diseases have approved therapies. So find the world's expert for Castleman disease, and he has seen 50 to 100 patients. There's no centralized database on how patients around the world have been responding to different therapies. So we have to rely on what he thinks is the best drug. But what we're trying to do with this registry natural history study is bring together data on patients from around the world 
so we know what is the best drug for that patient. Um, as I mentioned, 95% don't have an improved therapy. Clinicians have to use off-label drugs, of which there's no data. Um, pharma companies also want to generate data around this to take to payers to show that drugs are working in the real world. And they also have to do this for post-approval studies. Um, in addition, everyone's very excited about this idea of personalized medicine and precision medicine, the right drug for the right patient. But without data on what treatments work for what patients, you can't identify precision medicines. And so we, we hope to do this with this registry for Castleman disease. The last thing I'd mention is that I do see this as an issue beyond Castleman disease. And I've actually been working um, with several warden folks on an initiative to establish something that we're calling Cure Accelerator, which will be to create a platform um, that'll pull together a traditional patient registry through a new approach, but also combine it with a portal that connects patients, physicians, researchers, so that we can generate data behind what drugs work for what patients and start getting the right drug to the right patient. Um, so it, it, I want to close by uh, doing a bit of a call to action. So first off, for all of you brilliant MBAs, uh, business folks all around the world, we need you guys focusing on that black box in the biomedical research space. You guys do a great job commercializing products and taking things through um, the blue part of that spectrum I showed, but we really need you in that green space. We need smart people like you thinking about how do we innovate to improve drug discovery and to improve target discovery so that way better drugs get to patients. Um, and, and that can be incentivizing collaboration, aligning interests so that we can, we can really move things forward. In addition, I, I of course have to promote our website. I hope you guys will visit uh, castlemannetwork.org. And I hope you'll consider supporting what we're doing.